Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Twin Peaks is the greatest television show of all time. I don't care what any of these nerds babbling about Game of Thrones in the control room have to say. There has been no better vision of the possibilities of television than the masterful, masterful noir experimentation of Mr. David Lynch and Mr. Mark Frost. The tragic death of teenage Laura Palmer opened up a wide world of incredible characters, dark secrets, and bonkers mythology for its viewers. And Lynch and company fearlessly moved forward in their own bold way, never sacrificing vig vision for convention. Over the summer, Showtime aired Twin Peaks The Return, this third season literally taking place 25 years after the show's original run is arguably the best season of the entire show, and a late career masterpiece for Lynch, the season's sole director. Auteur television has never been this distinctive or artful. This new season took the dark and grimy subtext of the original show and made it text, exploring what happens in a world that falls to darkness despite all efforts to keep a veneer, and how, ultimately, we cannot prevent the ever-increasing evil that plagues the world that we inhabit. This season begins just as the last one left off. Dale Cooper has been sucked into the Black Lodge after nobly en entering to stop serial killer Wyndham Earl and saving Dale's girlfriend, Annie. In his place, Bob and the residents of the Black Lodge create an evil doppelganger of Cooper to walk the earth in his absence. Doppel Cooper's How's Annie? is one of the most chilling lines in all of television and a shocking cliffhanger to originally the show off on. The show's main driving conflict is the conflict between the various versions of Cooper roaming around in this new season. There is, of course, the Bob-assisted Evil Cooper, or Doppel Cooper, roaming around the country looking for Judy, the mother of all evil. The Cooper we all know and love manages to escape the Black Lodge and back to Earth, only to be forced into a brain-dead version of himself created by Doppel Cooper named Dougie Jones. He is trapped in a vessel that can hardly perform any basic human task, and it's quite tragic throughout the season to see our boy Cooper trapped inside Dougie. It's also extremely effective to not only create an ultimate question for this season that doesn't really get answered until episode 16, but it provides really interesting comic possibilities and a fascinating story in its own right. We want to see Dougie succeed and overcome the obstacles in his way, yet at the same time we're all eagerly awaiting Cooper to come back. Where's Cooper? Sorry, flashbacks. The pure form of Cooper being absent for most of the season is a key gateway to the major themes. Um, one of them being the unrelenting tide of change and unease. What is familiar is gone. The town of Twin Peaks has changed significantly under the original cast's feet. A new, younger generation of people are taking over, and the outlook for the town is notably more grim. Characters that we know and love are older, sicker, and worse for wear. Jerry Horn is a hippie schizophrenic who gets lost in the woods. The original Sheriff Truman is so sick he can't even work his job. And Sarah Palmer is a raging alcoholic. Jacoby runs a wacky Alex Jones-like talk show that he doesn't really believe in. And Audrey Horn is either trapped in a loveless marriage, in an insane asylum, or both. What the show once was, a pulpy soap opera parody noir filled with quirky characters and clear-cut conflicts, has morphed into a much darker, surreal show to reflect our darker, more complicated worldview that has crept into the media during the 21st century. David Lynch is telling us that the tides of time will continue to change without us, no matter what we do. Characters like Big Ed will be miserable and look awful because that's what time does to people. It barrels forward and doesn't care who lives or dies in its wake, but at least that got a happy ending. Speaking of things not being able to be stopped, another key theme of this season of the show is the inevitability of evil. Throughout the original run, the heroes of the show, such as Sheriff Truman and Dale Cooper, were beacons of purity and trust against the evils of the town and the Black Lodge. Despite the evil happening every day in the town, there would always be good men and women available to prevent it. Season 3, on the other hand, asks, but what if they couldn't? This brings us to episode 8, perhaps the single greatest episode of television that I have ever seen. There is an avant-garde sequence in the episode depicting the first explosion of the atomic bomb. Due to this great act of violence at the hands of man, um, Bob, a manifestation of pure evil, is birthed from Judy, the mother of all evil. This allows pure evil to manifest itself into the world of man in various forms, including a bizarre reptile creature that crawls into a girl's mouth due to evil spirit servants of the Black Lodge and the room above the convenience store, hypnotizing a local town over the radio. This plants the seeds for pure evil to infect and rot mankind. 
How does this inform the rest of the season, though? Let's start with the girl from episode 8. Popular fan theory is that this was Sarah Palmer, Laura Palmer's mother. This is reinforced later in the season, where she is seen being able to tear off her own face and exposing a terrifying black and white smile. She does this before, of course, she tears a man's throat out at a bar for calling her some bad names. This allows a perception that perhaps Sarah is the person that Judy has decided to possess, much like Bob possessed Leland, Laura's eventual killer. Um, this is nothing to say of the other evil Black Lodge-informed characters from this season. Richard Horn is the son of Doppelkummer and a presumably comatose Audrey Horn, and he murders a child and beats up his mother and mentally disabled Uncle Johnny. Evil is in his genes, literally. We can also examine how terrible violent acts seem to be far more prevalent in the world of the show in its modern setting. There are various incidents of random homicides, gruesome double murders, and disturbing abuse that haunts the show's run. However, through all this pain and suffering at the hands of the characters, there certainly is an end to it, isn't there? Not if the show has anything to say about it, or the finale, especially. In that final two episodes, Dale Cooper confronts and defeats his doppelganger and Bob's spirit in the process. After completing that task, he travels back in time to the happenings of Fire Walk With Me, the Twin Peaks film, in an attempt to save Laura Palmer's life. He figures that by preventing her death, he can prevent evil from ever descending onto the town that he cares so deeply about. However, as he leads her through the woods and away from her fate, she disappears in thin air, and a blood-curdling scream is let out. We see her body bag disappear from the beach, but the implications of what has happened are far from completely dissected. You see, as we were told in episode 8, Laura Palmer's death and spirit are the key to defeating Judy and sealing off the world from the evils of the convenience store in Black Lodge. She was literally sent down from the White Lodge, the heaven equivalent, for this purpose. When Cooper defeated Bob, he should have continued on his way and found a clear way to defeat Judy. But he was unfortunately misguided, and instead tried to save the town of Twin Peaks from ever suffering. Of course, this ultimately fails to stop Judy. What happens instead is that Laura Palmer's spirit is transferred into another universe, where Dale Cooper must enter in order to find her. He is given a new name, Richard. By the way, I don't think that's a coincidence, that's also the name of his evil son. Why? Because this reality is stripped of Cooper and what has stripped Cooper of what made him a pure-hearted hero. Diane, his assistant, could see it in his face as they were intimate. Either Cooper's trip to the Black Lodge or crossing over into the dimension that the mother of all evil, Judy, created, robbed Cooper of his innocence, making him a steely do-gooder that, while obeying an ultimate, the law and trying to ultimately do the greater good, he's robbed of his humanity. Cooper would never shoot a man in the leg without trying to reason with him first. When Cooper locates Laura, she is a woman from Texas with no recollection of her soul's previous existence. Um, Cooper takes her to her old house in Twin Peaks, only for everything to be completely different. When they arrive at the Palmer household, a completely different family is living there with no knowledge at all of the Palmers ever even inhabiting the house. This is where we see Cooper crack. He becomes frantic and worried, asking what year it is and pacing nervously. Laura Palmer, remembering her past life, lets out a scream, and the house lights go dark. This ending is extremely disquieting to me. The show effectively makes Cooper a Philip Jeffries type figure, doomed to hop around time and space until he is able to find out what his true cosmic purpose is and how he should accomplish it. One could guess is that he is destined to defeat Judy and save Laura Palmer, but until he can achieve either of those tasks, he is doomed to live in a loop of time and space, trying and failing to accomplish his cosmic goal. The influence of the Black Lodge is keeping him trapped, and his various visits to this dark realm are having an incredibly negative effect on his psyche, apparently, as he has become a lot darker of a character in that final episode in his Richard form. I believe that it's no accident that Jeffries and Cooper both asked, what year is this, as one of the first things they said when they realized they had changed timelines. Which brings me to my ultimate point of argument, finally. What was the main thesis of this revival? This is not arguably a huge question, but what I think it boils down to is that this show, much like most of Lynch's work, involves the ever-increasing darkness taking over what was once light, and the contrast and conflict between these two worlds of light and dark, good and evil. This has been visible in Twin Peaks ever since Laura Palmer was established as a homecoming cocaine queen. This season commits to this in a full exploration through its various dealings with literal manifestations of evil taking over the town. 
I also don't think it's any accident that as the town is descending into evil, various town people are being found having extremely graphic and disgusting diseases and maladies, such as the child vomiting blood in the backseat of the car, or the woman in the bar with a really inhuman, disgusting rash. The return is ultimately about inescapable decay, and how that affects both of what we love and what is unfamiliar. And God, that doesn't even get to all the other things that I really loved about this season. That was just fan speculation. The acting, as expected, was stellar, especially Kyle McLaughlin, who juggled four distinct characters breathlessly. The filmmaking has been incredible, too, with some of the best cinematography and sound design of Lynch's entire career. I point out episode 8 in particular for being so well made, it stands on its own as one of the best experimental horror films of all time. There were certainly classic Lynchian moments throughout that reminded us just what the madman was capable of behind the camera. And all these discomforting and wild scenes only furthered the mood and atmosphere. I point especially to the scene where Richard Horn harasses and assaults Johnny Horn and his grandmother. Johnny Horn's repetitive teddy bear saying, Hello, Johnny, and the sheer terror Richard was bringing down on his family made for one of the most disquieting scenes in recent television memory. Though the season wasn't always perfect, you know, some of the acting was a little off looking at you, Tammy, and there were a few plot lines that I wish got a bit more screen time looking at you, Audrey, it was always distinctive, and that's about the most you can ask for in this age of television. This particular revival has been one of the most fascinating pieces of work in all of modern TV. It's a bold art house statement in the middle of a homogenized TV landscape. While everyone else was freaking the hell out about the White Walker dragon twist, that rang extremely hollow to me. I was more concerned about the fate of Dougie Jones or how Richard Horn would be captured or what was up with Diane or why James was ever allowed to apprise just you and I in front of a paying audience. This is something I'd never be able to think Lynch enough for this season. Though the story was dark and at times imperfect, I mean, did we really need that two-minute sweeping scene set to green onions? It was always emotionally charged and engaging. Call it nostalgia. Call it highbrow for, being the sake of, for the sake of being pretentious. Call it whatever you want. Twin Peaks is the most important TV show in the entire world to me. And I'm so glad that I was able to revisit the world for 18 episodes and see things through a new, darker lens. Lynch has provided to us, Lynch has proved to us, I should say, that nostalgic comeback series don't need to be congratul congratulatory pats on the back, you know, like Will and Grace. They can be challenging, dense works that challenge viewers of the original while still giving them something completely stunning. This has been your web exclusive for the week. I'm Brandon Kratkowski. I apologize, and I've got one more question. Got a light?